I used to always love this Spongebob RPG fan game. The concept of going around Bikini Bottom and doing tasks for different characters was a cool one that had a lot of potential. So I was glad to hear that in 2011, an official game with a very similar premise came out. It was developed by Workin' Man for Nickelodeon's website. It was called Spongebob's Big Adventures. You went around to different locations, completing tasks and meeting characters from the Spongebob TV show. It was a beloved game that many people fondly remember, but it was eventually kicked off the website. This is because it was replaced with a bigger version of the game called SpongeBob's Next Big Adventure. It came out in 2012, and many consider it one of their favorite Flash games. So let's check it out and see how it is. We start in SpongeBob's dimly lit house, and he decides he wants to go on an adventure. He should consider reviewing old games on YouTube. But first, he has to feed his snail Gary. Ugh, the food's running away again. Usually it's the fridge that does the running. I like the shade on the art in this. It gives the game a more distinct style. It plays out like a point-and-click game where you click to tell SpongeBob to go somewhere. SpongeBob really excelled in the point-and-click genre. If we look at the top of the screen, we have a few options we can't do too much with just yet. As you can see, we can gain both experience and money. We also have menus for careers, current quests, a world map, and an inventory. We can also see our current rank, which changes with each experience level. Right now, we're at Tenderfoot. I mean, I've heard of a McNugget foot, but not a Chicken Tenderfoot. Right away, we know we're in for something big, so buckle up because this game wasn't lying when it said we were going on an adventure. Outside, we find that Plankton has committed his most dastardly act yet. He's stealing Gary's food. For some reason, he thinks snail food is the secret Krabby Patty formula and he wants to steal it. So now we're on to our first boss fight. Unlike in the RPG we mentioned earlier, Plankton isn't completely unbeatable this time. He's actually really easy. You drag the mouse to sling a rock or something at him as he flies up and down. You do this until his health bar is drained. I'm not entirely sure what your weapon is supposed to be, though. It's like a lasso slingshot sort of thing. It throws pink rocks, but the one we see here is obviously green. Strange. So you have to reclaim the food and head back to Gary. Whenever you complete a mission, you have to wait for Spongebob to finish a little victory dance before you continue. They just want you to practice your patience. Also, no, I don't know why the mouth on the fish decoration looks like that. It's best not to ask questions. Outside, we see a very happy looking Squidward, and we can even poke in on Patrick here. If we talk to Squidward, we ask him to join us on an adventure, but he just walks away. How sad. <laughs> The dialogue is a little fast, and it's easy to accidentally skip some when you're clicking through it. You better hope you don't miss anything important. Then Gary shows up and brings you a map, allowing you to use your map option to travel Bikini Bottom. We can see a good few locations here. Let's start by going to work at the Krusty Krab. Here, there are cars driving around, pedestrians, and Sandy with her arm behind her tail. She says she has a surprise at her tree dome, so you decide to skip out on work to go get your water helmet, or as the game calls it, your fish bowl. I imagine that description is a little condescending to a world of fish. You can't work just yet anyway, so you head to get the fishbowl and find Patrick is stuck inside it. I know it's canon that Patrick will just let himself into Spongebob's house at random, but it's kind of silly that he felt the need to try Spongebob's water helmet when he has one of his own. How is his any different? They always looked about the same size. But I guess that's just Patrick for you. You need jellyfish jelly to slide him out, so it's off to jellyfish fields. It's a vacant landscape apart from the jelly, so you can just take it and go. It's best if we don't wander too far and risk finding a time-traveling vortex. Once you get your helmet, you can head to Sandy's tree dome. There, you find out the surprise is in her tree because she chased the mailman up there. What does Sandy have against mailmen? I'd get it if she was a dog, but a squirrel? Maybe I should round up a few squirrels for a home defense squad. So now we get a mini game where we climb the tree and collect letters while moving out of the way to avoid branches. If you hit three of them, it's game over. You only need to get one letter in the story, so I don't know why you have to collect so many. Once you beat a level, you get an envelope. Then you find it contains two tickets to Glove Universe, a theme park from the SpongeBob episode Glove World R.I.P. Let's just hope it's closer than Neptune's Paradise. Before we go there, let's head to work. At the Krusty Krab, you hear that someone disconnected the gas pipe in the kitchen. I sure hope no one tried to turn it on then. So you get this mini game where you look for missing pipes and click on them. It's amusing, and it isn't too hard. Once you do this, you unlock the fry cook career. You can do different careers throughout the game to make money, but you don't actually do a lot of spending in this. For your fry cook job, you put patties on the grill, flip them when they start looking crisp, but then when they're cooked enough, you throw them on a bun and add condiments. Some customers request ones without certain condiments, and if you get an order wrong, Mr. Krabs yells at you. It sounds easy, but you are being timed, so you want to move a little fast. 
I often end up making mistakes because of this. One funny thing I found a little confusing is that the game tells you well done whenever you do something right. For a second, I wondered if it said this because I made a well done burger. I wondered if I could make different types like medium rare. We then see Mr. Krabs selling a jar right here in the kitchen. Good thing there's a J on it so we all know it's a jar and not like a bar or a car or something. It costs $10 so you work until you can afford it. Outside, you find out it belongs to Patrick who you plan to go jellyfishing with but he's lost all his equipment and you have to find it. Spongebob also says they're part of the jelly spotter, so maybe that's what the J stood for. You can find Patrick's shirt at the chum bucket, and Karen's inside, but she doesn't do anything just yet. His net is over by your house, but the only way to get glasses for him is by talking to Squidward. He sends you to fill in for him as the Krusty Krabs cashier in exchange for them. Now this is where we get our lovely dose of edutainment. We get to solve math problems in a Spongebob game. Oh dear Neptune, could there be anything worse? You're being timed to add a customer's payment, so as someone who has to mentally count a problem out in their head, this is clearly a lot of pressure for me. Nah, not really. Most of the problems are easy and you only really have to do it for one round. But I often forget to account for the zeros in the answer, so I end up putting in the wrong one. At least this one minigame handles math a lot better than most edutainment games do. So you get the glasses from Squidward and you can go jellyfishing with Patrick. Then you get an interesting minigame. You have to run along and catch jellyfish while clicking to drag Spongebob and Patrick across the screen. You can also make them jump to catch jellyfish in the air, but the ones on the ground will just electrocute you. <laughs> Did you see that? He just shrieked in pain for no reason. It's best to just keep them jumping non-stop. You don't really need to drag them. So that wraps things up for Patrick's storyline. If we head to the Krusty Krab, we meet a random fish who sends us to the frozen tundra from the Spongebob episode Frozen Face-Off. Your friends have been frozen in the tundra, completely disregarding wherever they currently are in the story, so you have to find them. Like in the jellyfish minigame, you drag Spongebob around and make him jump over balls of snow. Unfortunately, you have to be a little specific when making him jump. He has to be directly in front of the ball to go over it. Any more or less won't give him enough space. Squidward, Patrick, Mr. Krabs, and Sandy are frozen, so you just run into their ice cubes to save them. Then without warning, you're met with the abominable snow mollusk from the episode. This activates a boss fight where you use your rope lasso thing while avoiding the snowball she shoots at you. Patrick also pokes his head in for some reason. This is the only boss fight where you can actually get hurt, so the stakes are higher than they usually are. But once she's defeated, you get experience points. So now let's head to the chum bucket and see what Karen wants. Here, you play a simple game of Pong against her in exchange for finding out what Plankton's up to. It's just standard Pong, not much to say. You need 7 points to win, but this is where things got confusing. After I beat her, her quest icon didn't go away. But when I clicked her again, I accidentally moved the dialogue too fast and ended up playing another Pong game. I thought this might have been a perpetual mission without any end goal, so I quit the Pong game and left the chum bucket to start the Glove Universe mission. I figured if I undertook another quest, this one would go away. We'll come back to this later. So when you visit Sandy, you can finally go to Glove Universe. You give the two suspicious figures out front your tickets and head inside. This brings you to the most involved location in the entire game. Right away, we have two different stands we can play games at. The first is a dart shooter where you click to align two different darts on a designated balloon, then a dart is thrown to pop it. You need to burst three to win. If you miss one, you can't win, but the game doesn't end as soon as you miss. Though you still get money no matter what, so that might make it worth it. The other stand is a seahorse race where you select a seahorse and button mash either the mouse or the space bar to race to the finish line. It's very easy. Mystery here is belching for some reason. So if we move to our right, we see the museum has a display for a rare deep sea squirrel. Doesn't sound like anyone we know, does it? If you talk with Sandy, she asks if you want to check out the Tunnel of Love. Now hold on there, Squirrel. We all know SpongeBob's heart is on reserve for Squidward. Once you go in, you find it's too dark to see. Then Sandy disappears. It's okay, SpongeBob. I'm used to being left alone on dates too. So you have to talk to this glove guy so he'll let you in the back room, but I got a message telling me to complete my current quest first. This made me a little nervous because I assumed Karen's quest was perpetual. I wondered if the game had glitched and become unbeatable. But then I went back to Karen and actually saw what she had to say. I had to win two more matches against her before she would tell me the secret. That's 14 more points you need to score, so you might grow a little tired of ponging by the end of it. Thankfully, she isn't that good. Once you win, Karen says that Plankton is downtown trying to steal more snail food. Considering how long it's been, I'd say his mission should be completed by now, but let's head downtown to stop him anyway. Oh, look how gigantic he is. Forget his snail food scheme, I want to know what he invented to make himself that big. As interesting of a location as downtown is, the only thing to do is battle Plankton once again. 
I'm sure he'll be much harder to defeat than before he's defeated already. That wasn't really hard, was it? Plankton is so impressed that he agrees to stop trying to get the formula and offers you a job. You accept it, so now you work as a fry cook at the Chum Bucket. But someone ought to tell the developers that Chum isn't actually green. SpongeBob sure made a fuss in that one episode for someone who just willingly works for Plankton in this. So now let's go save Sandy. The glove mascot will let you in the back door if you win prizes for him, so you have to play the Dart and Seahorse minigames to do so. He lets you in the back room, and you find that the head of the park has locked Sandy in a cage. Apparently this whole thing was a scheme from the very beginning. He sent her those tickets so she'd come to the park where he'd be able to capture her and put her on display. You didn't think this game would have such a layered storyline, did you? Though I'm not sure why he gave her two tickets. Wouldn't that just increase the chances of her bringing someone who could save her? So now you have to fight this wretched fiend. We'd better prepare for the most intense, most exhilarating, most bone-chilling battle of our lives. <laughs> That was even easier than both of the Plankton battles. So you save Sandy and put the park owner on display instead. I can't imagine too many people would be interested in seeing that, though. And that concludes both this storyline and the story of the entire game. This Glove Universe section actually reminds me of Sam and Max Hit the Road, mostly because of the ending twist and the Tunnel of Love segment. Overall, I really enjoyed this little adventure. The five ranks you can get through experience are Tenderfoot, Hitchhiker, Traveler, Explorer, and Adventurer. You could also get achievements back when this was on the Nickelodeon website. One of them is called Workin' Man, which is likely a reference to the company, which might also be a reference to a song by Rush. So again, this is a lot of fun. It's nice to wander around and be part of Bikini Bottom. You could also keep yourself entertained with all the mini-games here. The character interactions are also really nice. This was a really good addition to Workin' Man's catalog of Nickelodeon games, and I'm happy we went through it. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.